Welcome to another episode of Strange Planet. On this episode, just over 47 years ago, one of the most significant shipwrecks on the Great Lakes ever occurred. That, of course, of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which went down on November the 10th, 1975, leading to the loss of 29 lives. And it is perhaps the most well-known sh shipwreck, largely because of the popularity of the 1976 Gordon Lightfoot hit, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Here to discuss is journalist, author, former TV news reporter, and historian Rick Mixter, who specializes in maritime and aviation history. He's been awarded by the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History. He's been featured on PBS and the History Channel and served as president of the Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association, one of the most requested speakers on the Great Lakes. He's versed in everything from shipwrecks to lighthouses and even aviation. Previously, he published Bottled Goodbyes, Aviation and Maritime Disasters, The Wheelsman, and the latest, Tattletale Sounds, The Edmund Fitzgerald Investigations, which serves as a companion to the best-selling video, The Edmund Fitzgerald Investigations. Rick Mixter, welcome back to the program. How are you? Richard, I'm doing well, and thank you so much for having me back. My pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, so Tattletale Sounds, uh, the book just just newly out in time for the uh, the 47th uh anniversary tell me about the the uh, the title tattletale sounds what is that all about well you mentioned the patron saint of maritime history himself gordon lightfoot and in his song he says the the wind and the rails made a tattletale sound he was talking about the clanking that you get when the winds rage over 60 70 miles an hour especially against metal and the terrifying sounds that they make for me, it's not only that, but it's also the tattletaling behind the scenes of the investigations, especially. So we go from the building of the Fitzgerald, where I've interviewed three, well, four guys that actually built the Fitzgerald, into the career of the Fitzgerald, where I've interviewed three third mates that served on board. I've interviewed cooks that were on board, um, just to get the background on it. And then go into the uh, the investigations, which is really where you know I hang my hat. That's where I've been doing the most research. It's where I've interviewed people from every one of the investigations. And this is a tattletale behind the scenes of the minutia that's never been published before. So from tattletales to tales of the tape, let's talk about the 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 vessel itself. Give us the the, the dimensions, and then we'll get into a little a little bit of the history. Absolutely. The Detroit area had been sh building ships for over 200 years. I and mean, this is a, you know, a Mecca really from the St. Clair River to the Detroit River. And in the Ecorse area, the Great Lakes Engineering Works had turned out 301, well, 300 uh, hulls before. And then the Fitzgerald was hull 301. And it was after a little bit of a lapse. So it, it came out, it was going to be the largest freighter ever built. And so the biggest object ever to drop into fresh water. And it was built by the uh, Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company. It was a complete um, investment for them to be able to take those $8 million and really vie not only for the other freighters that they own, which they quickly sold off once the Fitz started hauling all their cargo, but also the investment that they had into a pelletizing plant in Minnesota. So again, my book goes into not only you know what Northwestern Mutual's uh, buy-in was for this, but also the president, and of course his name was uh, Edmund Fitzgerald. So that's really kind of the background of when it splashed into the water in 1958. It was uh, 729 feet long. It was huge, and everybody turned out. The, the newspapers all said 10,000, but I've seen three different angles that I've used in my documentary, and I don't think there's 10,000, but boy, did people turn out to see that vessel go in. Right. And it was a bit of a, um, I guess for people that are uh, into ship watching, it was kind of a fan favorite and largely because of its captain. It really was. And, you know, when it was launched, there was talk of a person having a heart attack. In my book, I go into two people that were killed. So there was a little bit of an omen to it. Um, so it, there was, you know, I think as it went in and, and had uh, problems in its shakedown crews and all these other things, it was supposed to be the queen of the lakes, obviously. And it held that title very shortly um, because the, another vessel was already on the ways at Great Lakes Engineering, the Homer, that would best it. Um, but the Fitzgerald was outfitted as a flagship. That means that 
Uh, the whole first level with the captain's offices also had uh, guest suites so that the presidents of National Steel and uh, Northwestern Mutual and all these people could go on tours during the summer. And it had all of its outfittings from Hudson Corporation. So it was like you know, a living room to a house. It had air conditioning and every sailor wanted to be there. And they picked only the best, including the cooks, because they would be cooking for these VIP guests. I, I mentioned that it was kind of a fan favorite for for ship watchers. Tell me about uh, Captain Peter Pulser. Pulser was fantastic. I, I've gotten two different stories on Peter, and I go into extreme detail in the book of of Peter's um, he near miss on on board a whaleback that was crashed into um, Muskegon. He also lost his brother in an accident on the whaleback court. Um, but he was the DJ captain that would always play through the broadcast the the big. Uh, um, horn on the top, uh, all of his favorite records. And uh, he was a top 40 DJ and he was known for playing Christmas tunes as he went through the river system where people could hear it. And he was also known for yelling at boats that got too close to him, you know, if they wouldn't hear his danger signal. Uh, I just talked to another third mate that worked with him who said he was just really tough to be around. And uh, that the only thing that uh, Pulser would do is he'd look at him and say, hey, are, where are we at now? And, and the guy would always have an answer for him. And he earned Pulser's respect for being, you know, on top of things as a third mate. Because that third mate's kind of training as they uh, work their way up to captain. And on the Fitzgerald, it was a temporary position. You didn't keep third mates for very long because they'd eventually move to second, first, and then get their own ship. It's kind of ironic, you know, this this tragedy that claimed all 29 crew members because there was a time not too long before where the Edmund Fitzgerald was receiving safety awards. It really was. And it, it, it was a very safe ship. I mean, there's a couple of accidents. And that's uh, part of the reason that I heard off the record that why Pulser was removed. I, he actually retired was the official word. Um, but I had heard he hit another ship uh, trying to pass too close. Uh, so that, that you know, you, you hear these things and not so much of it's been published, maybe more tattletales than I than I need to share. Um, but really, it, it had a fairly safe uh, record. It hit the Sulox, um, just bounced into him and did some damage. Um, it had some damage as it was unloaded, especially when it went into the cranes um, at Zug Island, where they would always seem to hit the hatch combings. And that was significant because that's an area where when the water gets, you know, big waves and if they're really low in the water carrying a lot of cargo, that water can get into the cargo hold. And that's significant. So in terms of its construction, I mean, just in in general, like these great lake freighters in general, um, are, are they... Are they constructed to last a long time? I mean, I would think because it's, you know, fresh water versus salt water that they might have a longer life. Absolutely. And the ones that were built at the turn of the century, 1906, 1907, were built with a very brittle steel. So we saw accidents in 1958, the Bradley, one of the largest vessels that it was the queen of the lakes for 20 years, um, sank in 58 by ripping across the deck. The Daniel J. Morrell literally ripped into two pieces and the stern kept going uh, five miles away and only one survivor. And this was that brittle steel in 1966. Fitzgerald was built with a little, you know, obviously the, the problems of the that um, dangerous steel were gone, but they also said that there was some issues with the steel that they had, at least some of the people I've talked to. Um, the Jackson is still sailing. That came out after the Fitzgerald, one of the last built in Michigan. So it's hard to really push at um, the design of the ship, which was three different holds. They were separated by what they called screen bulkheads, so they weren't watertight, and they had little doorways that they could actually drive bulldozers through. So you'd actually, when you unload, you would take out the cargo with giant huge cranes or these uh, clamshell buckets and then they would lower down a uh, end loader that would go inside and go through each hull and pull those holds all together and then let them scoop it all out so that you know they wasn't watertight and that was a big contention from the coast guard when it went down that we have to stop this we've got to improve all the other freighters and you saw the shipping companies snap back immediately and say no 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 we think it ran aground and that's significant uh, what kind of people worked on Great Lake freighters or what kind of people do work on Great Lake freighters? Oh, man, it's a, it's just like any place else where they would work. But you do see a lot of people who are loners, you know, people who like being away and, and families. If you look at a sailor's family, 
the wife is really the boss, you know, and it's very difficult as I talk to families of sailors when the sailor comes home for the winter to try to get that dynamic back. But so many people do it so well. Um, but it is a difficult job. It's a difficult place. And there was um, lots of reports of alcoholism on the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, as we see, again, it typically any, you know, workplace, I would say, but um, it was a, a crew that I think changed a little bit. There was only a couple guys on there, the whole, the engineer and uh, the captain and the uh, wheelsman that had been there for a while, um, especially the uh, the wheelsman. I heard he was a plank owner, John Simmons. And that means he was on from the day it launched that he was the wheelsman. So he was up for retirement too. So ages 18 to retirement age, really um, on board and the dynamics that come with that. And because it, it launched in 58, sank, of course, in 75. I mean, who knows? It could have had another 30, 40 years uh, run. Um, Absolutely. But are, are there still um, many uh, crewmen who worked previously on the Edmund Fitzgerald that are still around? Or are they Not a whole around? bunch. Yeah, and I'm lucky because I do so many lectures on the Great Lakes that I seem to attract the people that come in. So many of them were porters where they would be like not a cook, but below the cook where they would take care of the captain's linens or, you know, bringing food around and stuff when they had guests. Um, all the way into some of the engineers, um, very, very lucky, as I mentioned, to be on the command crew to talk to the mates that kind of knew what was going on, knew some of the issues with the boat. Uh, very few knew about the structural issues, but all of them agreed it was a very strange uh, sailing boat. Even a 10-foot sea would cause that vessel to torque, and some of them would even say that it would kind of sway from the back. And there was intense uh, stress on the keel, and the Coast Guard knew about this, and they they had actually had some uh, charts that when it was repaired, the, the cook that I interviewed, George Bergner, uh, his nickname was Red. Uh, Red said he went down there when they were putting the bow thruster in with a propeller in the front of the boat to help them turn in tight quarters. Uh, he said that they could see where they just put welding rod at the keel to patch it over. And many of the workers at Fraser Shipyard in, in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, were like, yeah, that's not the right way to do it. Another thing that Dred brought up to me was the, the how fast it was built. Four months faster than the William Clay Ford, the boat that was just before it. So a lot of people looked at that too. But as we look at the Jackson still sailing, you know, and uh, now it's got a big crane on it. Fitzgerald, if it did stay, and it probably would have because of its size but um, the Jackson did get a crane and um, was modified and it's still sailing today so it's hard to argue that the other one that was a sister ship or a near sister the Homer which almost looked like the Fitz at least in the front section almost exactly um, that one was scrapped out um, when the industry just didn't need it anymore and uh, unfortunately um, that one's not in the lakes anymore because it was a, it was a beautiful boat just like the Fitz was so give us a just a a, a brief timeline from the day it left Superior, Wisconsin in the afternoon, November 9th, and uh, under uh, Captain Ernest McSorley, and just kind of take us from there to the uh, the bottom of Lake Superior. Absolutely. It, it was the uh, November 9th when they left, and they, they, they normally didn't load there. In fact, the guy that loaded the Fitzgerald at Burlington Northern, which are the tallest on the uh, Great Lakes, in fact, dubbed the world's tallest ore docks, they loaded it up. They put 26,000 tons of pellets in there. That's over a billion iron ore pellets look like marbles. And uh, these are just a way that they can transport iron ore dust, if you will, that gets rolled into a little pellet. And that makes it easier to carry by train, dump it into a boat, send it out, and then scoop it back into a train and uh, bring it down to wherever they're going to make steel at it. In many cases, that'd be like Reserve in Kentucky and uh, other places like that. Um, so they would they left out of Superior, which was not normal. They um, didn't were not full and, and in, in total indifference to to Mr. Lightfoot. They were not bound for Cleveland and they were not fully loaded for Cleveland. They were uh, partially loaded because they were going to the Detroit River and the, the river was uh, so shallow that if you carried it as much as they could carry in the winter, it would hit bottom. So they partially loaded, uh, but twenty six thousand tons. She could carry thirty one thousand is the max I think I've seen. So it was it was pretty loaded and uh, went into a storm and immediately had uh, gale warnings. They knew that there were small craft advisories. And as uh, Fitzgerald passed uh, two harbors and was headed for the island up there, uh, Isle Royal, 
the uh, Anderson joined them. So just behind them, and of course, Fitzgerald is much faster, and it passed and, uh, and kept accelerating um, as it went across the lake. The captain of the Anderson, uh, Cooper, said that he never went from full speed. So turn, throw the throttle down, and just away you go. And as they went through Isle Royal, they had a choice to make. Uh, here's these gale warnings that are coming. They saw the storm. They're both weather ships, so they're reporting to the weather service all the conditions that they see. They're looking at their forecast. Cooper said that he started to immediately do his own forecast. And as he looked at it, it looked like it was going to be a, a gale. And he wasn't really worried about a northwest gale at that time of year. 30 knots is not a bad gale. And he tried to clock at how long it would take to cross from Marquette to Ontario. And he guessed wrong. And they they really should. I mean, again, it, hindsight's 2020. And Rick is no captain. I, I'm not a, you know, a shipyard guy. I'm not a, a sailor. It's easy for me to guess what they were going to do. But there were bigger ships that hid at Isle Royal and took a pounding there too. Um, but the Blau was out in at Isle Royal, and uh, it was a uh, you know almost eighty feet longer than the Fitzgerald. The Anderson was bigger; it would just been lengthened that summer, that made it even slower. But that was eighty feet longer than the Fitzgerald. And as they got up towards the Slate Islands, another decision to make: do they stay up there where the waves won't build and drop their hook until it's done, or do they go for it? And they, Cooper said they just guessed wrong on on how fast that ship or that uh, storm was going to come across. So as they turned, they went through the lull of the storm storm where the wind started to change direction. Remember, a, a low goes counterclockwise. So in one direction, it's coming out of your northeast. And as soon as that passes you, now it's going to change direction and build out of Thunder Bay, Ontario. That's going to mean 60 mile an hour winds at the almost full length of Lake Superior, pushing and building three-story building size waves. This is how big they were going to be. And they thought they'd be through Whitefish Point and behind the point in time, and they weren't. They took on two big waves. It destroyed the lifeboat on the Anderson. And when they looked at their radar at 710, they had talked to the Fitzgerald and the Fitz had radioed in damage that it was listing. It had vents missing, meaning that at least one, well, probably two if they said vents, maybe more, eight inch holes in the deck are now dumping lake water in. And Cooper said 12 foot waves were on his deck. So they're, they blew out his lifeboat. They sped past the Anderson at 710 bad timing they had a snow squall that blotted out their radar blotted out their visual where they could no longer see the lights of the Fitzgerald and when they squelched it out they saw just for a second a blip and the wheelsman said on board the Cooper on board the Anderson said I think I saw a light go down they he thought it was the stern light of the Fitz but they, nobody else saw it they don't know if it was maybe lights at Coppermine Point which is totally possible um, but the, as soon as it cleared and they squelched it out and the snow dissipated, the Fitzgerald was gone. They could see the saltwater vessels that were coming around the point going bow into the storm. And uh, they just could not believe that the Fitzgerald was gone. And then they spent a half hour trying to call the Coast Guard to convince them. They um, they did make radio contact with Captain McSorley of the Fitzgerald. And he didn't he seem to indicate that everything was OK? Yeah, in fact, uh, it was so okay that Bernie Cooper, the captain on the Anderson, hadn't slept. So he was like, you know, hey, I had a stern sea. We were hardly rolling. So again, Gordon Lightfoot says, fellas, it's too rough to feed you. That's not true. Uh, they had a stern sea. So the, everybody got their meals. Um, but the... Uh, um, the ride was so comfortable and Cooper was not bothered by, he looked at the radar and he saw how close the uh, um, McSorley was to the island. And he later said that, that they ran aground, but I don't believe that he really believed that because he went to bed, you know, he went down to lay down and get some much needed rest. He deserved it. Uh, when he came back up, Morgan Clark, the uh, first mate, had been talking to the Fitzgerald, and the Fitzgerald was very concerned about those three saltwater vessels. The Averfors, um, the uh, Benfrey, and the Nanfrey were coming around the point. They're getting hit by 60, 75 mile an hour winds. They're only going one knot. So when before the radars went out on the Fitz, he didn't want to hit them in the snow squall. It was blinding snow. And he said, would you keep me posted on those vessels? I lost my radars. And so uh, Morgan called him and said, no problem. You're going to clear him fine. How are you doing with your problems? And that's when McSorley said, I'm holding, we're holding our own. And that was the last uh, transmission by, by 715, they had nothing left. And that's when they think it went down 710. So Rick, uh, what is it about Lake Superior uh, that makes it so treacherous in November? 
It, it's a lot of things that happen in the in the fall. We start to see the lake starting to cool off. So they've spent all summer gathering this heat up, and now they're letting it go in a form of condensation going up, you know, and literally evaporation, forgive me, evaporation going up into the atmosphere. Now add in Canadian Arctic air that's coming down and then all that moisture from the Gulf. And this collides in the September, October, especially November. And this is a time traditionally that all the ships are trying to run to get their cargoes because once the lakes freeze, that's it. If you've got the iron ore, the wheat, the coal, and all the other commodities we carry, that's all you're going to get all winter. So they push real hard in the early days of the big storms of 1905, 1913. We saw big risks being taken. You don't see so many as we went into 1975. And with new technology, they had weather satellites by 75. Um, a lot of technology that allowed them to follow uh, radio beacons um, but unfortunately, it just wasn't enough. And with a power failure at the Whitefish Point, some of that technology was no use for the Fitzgerald. And uh, that I'm sure played a part into it. But we know that the Fitzgerald started to say, you know, we're, we're, we're going to slow down. We're going to let you gain on us so that the, the Anderson could be closer in case something bad happened. And Cooper said in an interview that um, that slowing down, maybe he would have made it. That, that haunted him till he died, that the Fitzgerald did slow down and that he really couldn't do much. And uh, even though we know that Cooper did the most, I mean, out of all the captains, out of all the ships, uh, there was a, at least five different ships that were Whitefish Point that were asked to help. And only Cooper and, and the William Clay Ford and the Hilda Marjane turned around to uh, go look. They almost did make it, though, didn't they? I mean, according I, again, I'm going by the, the Lightfoot song. They would have made Whitefish Bay if they'd put 15 more miles behind her. They were close. Yeah. 15 miles to, to break that wind. And, and really, Whitefish Point kind of comes up. It looks like a, a shark fin, if you will, on the upper peninsula of Michigan. And it does. It protects that whole area. Inside that bay, though, it was still pretty stirred up. In fact, there were some fishermen that were missing that I talk about in the book that the Coast Guard told uh, Cooper to look for. He said, there's a 16-foot boat. There was actually two of them that were missing. These poor guys stranded on, on Tequamanan Island. Um, they made it uh, through handily, but uh, not without almost having their fish shack torn apart. Um, but uh, really, Cooper was like trying to convince them, hey, there's a 729-foot freighter and 29 guys on it that are missing. And when the Coast Guard finally came to their senses and said, you know, we're scrambling airplanes, we'll get helicopters up there, but we don't have a cutter that can make it there in less than 20 hours. Wow. I mean, even if if they were there immediately, it, they wouldn't have gotten to it in time, right? It, how quickly did it go down? It was within moments. And, I, you know, you'd like to hope that mercifully it went down, you know, when the lyric from Lightfoot is when the waves turn the minutes to hours. Um, it really is, you know, um, so fast that they they kind of I, I don't believe that they nosedived. I believe they were pushed under. But I it, by looking at the spill patterns on the bottom, it seems to me that they broke up on the surface. And this is not very popular amongst the people who thought about it. There's not a single painting that looks like that. Everybody shows, you know, that nosedive down. And that's why it went so quickly. It just doesn't play out for the, the, the amount of uh, stuff that I've done on the bottom. I've been down for an hour and 26 minutes. Um, then I've looked at all the footage from the Coast Guard. I've looked at all the footage from the uh, 89 expedition, uh, all the stuff we've had from uh, 94. Um, so there's been so much stuff. But the problem is we haven't done everything down there. And there's still a lot of mystery. How deep uh, is it? 550 at the very deepest. So as you get around the stern section, that's about the deepest. Um, 480, I think, to the pilot house or so. So there's no natural light. You lose that as you go past 250 feet, even though Lake Superior is so beautifully clear. Um, as you go through, it becomes you know darker and darker. And finally, you have to turn on your lights. And then you realize you're amongst on the bottom a moonscape of this thick clay and lumpy soil that really does look like a moon. And then as we went across, we were lost for the first 10 minutes. And then we realized we had been on top of the deck. I was over by hatch five. 
and didn't even realize it because it's buried in a hillside. So we came over and all of a sudden here's ship and it's just bottom, bottom, and then a ship begins. And then as you go over the starboard edge, it's a cliff straight down from the side of the vessel. So imagine 30 feet of steel, you know, on that other side. So it's it's a very unique shipwreck. I've never seen anything like it. And to go past the name Edmund Fitzgerald that, you know, seemed to me to be over a foot and a half tall letters, it was just mind numbing. You're super excited. You can't believe you're on the greatest shipwreck on the on the Great Lakes, you know, Gordon Lightfoot song. And then all of a sudden uh, we found one of the missing crewmen. And then we went to that bottom of, oh my God, this is a, a graveyard. This is horrible. You know, you feel just horrible for even being there. And it's just emotionally draining because you go on such a roller coaster ride. Uh, only one, and he was still in his life jacket. That's the strange part. How is it that the Coast Guard looked in 76 and they thoroughly examined it? Not every piece. I mean, I've, I've listened to the uh, the recordings of them. I'm the only person who's listened to all of it and logged it all out. Um, I've shared that in the book as well, all the highlights of what they were looking for. So it wasn't a thorough survey, but go into 1980, um, Cousteau sent the sub down, Falco and Colin Monnier, the uh, cinematographer that was working on uh, St. Lawrence Seaway movie. Went down for a half hour and then the winds changed. Jean-Michel Cousteau told me that um, it was so fast because the storm came in that they had to pull the sub back. And as you look at the, the log book, and I go into a lot of detail on the Cousteau expedition, because not much has been written about it, at least in English. They lost a diver on one of the Great Lakes, and I, I talk about that. Um, I go into why they were pushed and, and the window for diving the fits was very small, but it became a big deal for them. That was what they used in their advertisement was, you know, the St. Lawrence and the Edmund Fitzgerald. So it was significant, but only a half hour they were down there and then going to 89 and they had very limited access. They had all kinds of problems that I highlight in the book um, with the robot, the sea rover. Um, and then 94, the Clelia went down and did several dives. I think it was four or five dive, days worth of dives and uh, just really tourist stuff. They were trying to bring publicity to the Great Lakes to show how fragile of an environment it is. And they really didn't do a full survey, although Dr. McGinnis had promised the newspapers he'd make a map of it. I tried to find the map. I talked to the guy that supposedly made it and he said, oh, it's gone. I don't know where it is. <laughs> like, how do you lose a map of the Edmund Fitzgerald? So there's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of stuff before we got there. Not one single body had been talked about. Had they seen one? Maybe, but they didn't report it, which would be against uh, the Canadian license, you're supposed to report and record, you know, everything that you see and, and bring it back. And that's part of the license agreement. And that's what we did. We thoroughly filmed around close ups and far away shots. And when we came back, we realized that it would be a big deal. And boy, it was almost almost as many headlines as when the Fitzgerald sank. Because this has been played up as being the lake, it is said, never gives up its dead. And it's one of those mysterious vessels in 75. How is it possible that 29 guys vanished? All of our other major shipwrecks, like the Bradley and the Morrell, all gave up almost every one of their crew. The Bradley had two survivors. The Morrell had one. And then all the bodies washed ashore. 1913, so many of the crews came ashore in Godrich. Um, the 1940 storm, Canadian crews lost on the Minch, all mostly were found. I think one that wasn't. So in 1975, how did everybody vanish? And that was the big mystery. And I think why Gordon wrote the song. Right. Uh, I guess he, he read about it in Newsweek magazine. Uh, the mm -hmm. Cruelest Month, I guess, was the story and recorded the song in one take. Isn't that amazing? He was already finishing up the album. He'd been working on a, an Irish dirge and he transformed it into this song. Had a Detroit guitarist that gave us that haunting, haunting guitar. And then Pee Wee on the slide guitar that gives us kind of the wave sounds in the background. And it just made it into, you know, it just an amazing, first of all, to have six minute song as a former DJ, you're just in awe that anything would be that way. Then to be a history song, the only other one I can think about is American Pie. Um, and or maybe, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash when they sang about Ohio. Um, and I, there's one more that I think that was written about the big mining disaster up in Calumet um, that had headlines. But really, American Pie is the only other one that was that long that uh, that made the chart still. 
um, I mean, it's, it is a great song, but as you say, he did he make he made a few errors. He, the ship wasn't fully loaded, and it wasn't going to uh, Cleveland. It was going to an island off of Detroit. Um, what else did he get wrong? The the um, old I was very captivated, and I go into a chapter in my book about did the lake really never give up its dead, and is there a Chippewa legend for it? I mean, we have great biographers. Obviously, uh, the Native Americans have not had a written language before uh, the Europeans came, so it was all orally tradition. But much of that had been really transported over by uh, schoolcraft and so many other people that that really you know kind of. Uh, What's it called when you you uh, get with the or you stay with the the uh, tribes and and actually learn their stories and stuff? There's not a single story about that. There's not a native legend that I know of. And as I did newspaper searches, the lake that never gave up its dead is actually Tahoe. That was a hundred years before it's mentioned on the Great Lakes. So we kind of adopted it, and I I outlined it in the book exactly to the story of when I see that it starts to catch on the Great Lakes, um, what writer did it. So that's the, another one that um, it wasn't Gordon's fault. That was the Newsweek magazine, which also made the mistake of calling it the 1930 storm, uh, which was actually the 1940 storm, which which tripped up uh, Casey Kasem. If you listen to his countdown, he got it completely wrong, too, because they never checked it. They just went on Newsweek. Um, but then we, we go into uh, the old cook. Um, there wasn't uh, an old cook on board. The, there was an old cook but not the ship uh, cook that would have said, fellas, it's been good to know you. Uh, Rafferty had only been on for two weeks. He'd been on because George Bergner had bone spurs on his feet and he got off. He stayed in Texas, asked his family, should I go? And they said, no. And the, the shipping company called up and said, listen, you know, uh, Bishop's got ulcers. And uh, basically George said, he's going to have ulcers whether he's there or not, you know, so uh, let make him go. Well, Bishop didn't go and neither did Bergner and that replacement cook who I know his daughter very well, um, had to go. And Rafferty, you know, didn't really want to be there and sadly was lost. And we are here with Rick Mixter. The latest is Tattletale Sounds, the Edmund Fitzgerald Investigations. Kind of a companion to the, um, the, uh, the video, right? I'm so honored that uh, the video has done so well. It's the best-selling Edmund Fitzgerald video of all time. And that goes above Discovery Channel's program and everything. And it's just because... Um, I got lucky. I, I did, you know, 25 years of searching. I found the building footage of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which was mislabeled in a library. So a lot of things came in. Then add in all those personalities. And really, that's what the book and I think my documentary is about. It's about the people behind the stories instead of just being, you know, the boat or being the 29 that were lost, which are extremely significant. But there's been great books about it. Uh, Bob Hemming wrote a fantastic book about the crew. He talked to McSorley's widow and all these other people um, that were on board. I didn't feel that I needed to rehash that this many years later. But there's so many people like who flew the airplane to find it. They've always said it was a Navy plane. So I'm a reporter. Let's go find them. I found not only one crew, but they lost the Fitzgerald overnight because a buoy got ripped away and they had to call a second crew from Glenville or Glenview, you know, Illinois to come out and find it. So, so many things that I don't think are going to be like, um, you know, lightning bolt changes to to what we know of the canon of the Edmund Fitzgerald. But the truth is, I think if you read my book, you're gonna you're gonna totally rule out that it ever ran aground. That's first of all. There's 30 different reasons why um, I can prove that it didn't. But then go into a lot more detail on uh, a lot of the things that maybe they don't know about, and they certainly haven't been published. So, um, was it a perfect storm, so to speak, of uh, weather conditions, structural? Um, faults, uh, crew error. So much. And I, you know, again, it's hard to be the armchair quarterback here, but I could point to the captain's problems for, I've done 150 shipwreck dives. I've profiled um, the greatest storm since 1905. All of them have been, and in many cases, admittedly by the captains who survived, that they made a mistake on it. So yeah, I, I would say human error, I would say Fitzgerald had structural problems. We we know that it couldn't have just been the wave because the Anderson was right behind it. Why didn't it sink? 
the three sisters theory of the three giant waves that picked up the ship and folded it in half would have been worse for the and or for uh, the Cooper on the Anderson. So I, I don't think that that's possible. And there certainly weren't three reported waves either, um, which I'm sure would have hit uh, the Anderson. Um, I go into a lot of detail on the structural issues because that's what George Bergner, when the ship went down in the, 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 the company right away tried to cap how much money because an $8 million lawsuit was announced. They immediately came out and said, Hey, listen, you know, it's been traditional that you can only sue for the cost of the cargo which is just rock and uh, in a ship, which was less than $8 million. And uh, basically Bergner didn't think his friends were going to be taken care of. And, and he very much felt responsible for them being there. He brought several of them on board, including his porter. He worked with Cundy, um, all these guys that he knew personally. He helped them get their cars and their houses by co-signing loans for them. And now they were gone and they weren't going to get paid. So he blew the whistle and he started telling the, the company, I'll tell everybody about the structural problems. He heard the engineer talk about you know, how it needed to be fixed again and how McSorley said, hey, I'm almost done. I, I can't wait to get off this boat. You know, there's just all kinds of stuff. And then you hear uh, him uh, sitting out on the fantail when the, on one big storm. And he said, McSorley's going to sink this ship. I'm telling you. And he called the ship and he said, I'm going to open up the lifeboat. And they said, if you do that, that's a $500 fine to put it back in. So, you know, to see all this stuff and to realize that Fitzgerald, if you look at the weather reports, and I'm the first author to go heavily into all of the weather reports that Fitz made, it went through four gales in the 1975 alone, and it was the number one ship in the early 1970s for two years in a row for the biggest storms. It was like a, a, a hallmark for them to take these on. And I think it, every storm weakened it a little more, a little more. And to see them pushing with, you know, more cargo and cheating on fuel to get world records to get through, um, it, it's a, just a real recipe for disaster. And that's what happened. Any other, um, for you personally, surprises during the, uh, the investigation? Someone you spoke to, um, you've already told us some amazing stories about the cook, George Bergner, but any others that stand... Uh, I was so lucky to, to get um, almost three hours with Jim Wilson. He was the Coast Guard investigator. He was the, the sole freshwater guy that had some experience, and it, they really needed him on board. He wasn't originally supposed to go up during the Curve 3 dives on the Woodrush, and uh, the, basically the, the other crewman said, you know, we need you up there because you're going to know the different parts of a Great Lakes freighter. He also arranged for tours for the other guys to at least get a ship ride, a ride, you know, to, to, to familiarize themselves with a freighter and some of the backstories that he had and then combine that in with the hours of, of uh, little tiny conversations that you have with the curve pilot, which um, Larry was, was you know, I, I'd always been in awe because this is a guy that flew the ROV down to rescue a, a nuclear bomb when a B-52 crashed. Uh, he was one of the guys that uh, used the curve to go and rescue French pilots that had sunk in a, in a submarine. Um, so he's amazing. And then to hear his voices uh, on the tape and then to kind of pick out who each person was and what they were talking about. Much of the, it was, I couldn't print because it was colorful Coast Guard language. Um, but much of it was uh, just amazing behind the scenes. You know, what guy loved to eat peanuts and what guy, you know, was really looking at the hatches every time they'd find a hatch clamp that wasn't distorted. Um, it gave you such a good behind the scenes because I had access to a fly on the wall that was recording this. That's the same thing with the 1989 to, to hear Chris Nicholson, who has passed away. Uh, Captain Wilson just passed away a couple of months ago. That this, this is the last really hurrah. And I wish these guys would have seen the book because I think it really does kind of play into the, I don't want to say heroes, but definitely the main characters who were involved, who only really got, you know, a little byline and some of the other books that were, hey, by the way, another robot went down there or hey, Jacques Cousteau went down there when Jacques Cousteau had nothing to do with that until really it was time to get his picture taken in Detroit. So I, I, I like to, to play that out. I like to bring up the people who I think the technology and especially the technicians, uh, maybe as a camera guy, I, I feel it's important that those behind the scenes people get their day or get their due. And uh, I know you do, they do in Tattletale Sounds. You grew up on the uh, Upper Peninsula, or the you call it the UP, right? The UP. We do, yeah, just short of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Yeah, 
Uh, I was just on your website and there was a little story there about how some people think that the UP should be part of Wisconsin. <laughs> we that were for a little bit, yeah. Is, is, is that, t- it, that it turned, well, suggest that? Is that like, you know, taboo to say that? Oh, no, no. In fact, there was a push to become the 51st state. You know, it was a, a almost kind of a joke, but maybe not. You know, and, and if you look at it, I mean, it, it was a big dispute with Toledo, where Michigan really wanted to have Toledo as their port because it's so important on Lake Erie. And uh, it wasn't playing out that way because Ohio wanted it. So the big trade was that we got the UP, even though at the time we had five miles of water between the upper and lower peninsula. We didn't get a bridge to to bridge that until 57. So, you know, we had car ferries that would get us back and forth there. But this time of year, uh, you'd wait overnight practically to get a car ferry because of deer season going on now. And uh, for me in the UP, it was fantastic. I grew up in a trailer in Sands at the end of the flight line at KI Sawyer. That's why I'm so much into aviation because I'd see those B-52s, KC-135s and Delta Darts fly over every day. And I was lucky enough to be able to fly the last mission of the B-52 out of Sawyer, the place that I was born at. Wow. Is is the the legend and the and the mythos and everything that surrounds the the Edmund Fitzgerald is that still very much alive and part of the the culture of the UP? It really is, and I, I would say more than just the UP. I mean, obviously Canadians embrace it because of Gordon and and certainly. Um, our Great Lakes, the stories that we have here. I, I think it, it's not only legendary, but it's almost too much so, where a lot of us historians are kind of like, hey, that's good. But, you know, there's a, on that very same day, November 10th, there's over 80 ships that have been lost. There's over, you know, 120 other people who died in these crazy storms. It was in the middle of the 1913 storm, which went from the 9th, 10th, and 11th, that nobody had a song for. So it gets kind of skipped over. The 11th is the 1940 storm. You know, 60 people died there and and flipped over a Canadian ship and, I mean, ripped it in two pieces. And the the Davik also went down in 200 feet with L hands. Um, It was devastating. A million turkeys killed in one day just because of uh, temperature changes and hunters that were lost. So, yeah, there's a lot of other stories that didn't get Gordon songs. And we kind of fight for that. But that legend is secure with with. uh, with Gordon singing it every fall, we get to hear it again. And uh, many of the ship captains told me they hated the song just because of that, because it was just bringing back those memories. But I think the rest of us, you know, wear it as a badge of honor. And I know certainly the family members who originally weren't real happy with Gordon now are very, very much in his camp. They get free tickets to see his show. And many of them have pictures and autographs with him to say, you know, this is my man. This is the guy that, you know, keeps that alive. And he does. Tattletale Sounds, the Edmund Fitzgerald Investigations, just out. How do we get a copy? I'd love for people to go to their nearest maritime museum. That's my favorite because it supports the museum. If you can't find it and they don't have it, always feel free to go to shipwreckpodcast.com. Shipwreckpodcast.com has not only all of my products, DVDs and all three books, but it also has free downloadable um, stories on those other storms I've talked about. The Fitzgerald podcast is four hours long. It's $20 because it's so long and there's so much material, but it's everything I have in my closet for uh, the Fitzgerald and everything I've learned. So it's well worth it. Shipwreckpodcast.com. Shipwreckpodcast.com. Again, the book is Tattletale Sounds, the Edmund Fitzgerald Investigations. Don't forget the uh, the video as well, the Edmund Fitzgerald Investigations. Rick, always a pleasure and uh, great to talk to you on the, uh, the 47th anniversary thereabouts of the, uh, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Thank you for keeping our maritime history alive, Richard. It's always a pleasure. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.